to start off our services for this weekend as we talk about God's purity, God's righteousness, God's holiness. And uh, it's important to start off with that because God gave me a word. I've been asking God for a word for this particular weekend for quite a while now. And the Lord brought me to this particular passage and it's found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And let's take out, take a, take out our Bibles and look at what it says there. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And this is written by Paul. He says this, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible to God, alone is wise, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now this passage here was something written by Paul in his first letter to Timothy. And as I looked through that, I, I just felt led to bring this message to all of us this weekend. And the message I have for us this weekend is entitled, The Chief of Sinners. The Chief of Sinners. See, in this letter, that's what Paul refers to as he, he himself. He talks about how he talks about his, his, his sins, and yet he is the chief of all sinners. Now, what does he mean by chief of all sinners? It means that if he looks at his life, he will consider himself to be the worst of all sinners. He looks at himself and says, like, oh, if there was a rank of sinners, I will be the highest ranking sinner, meaning that I'm the best at, sinner, at sinning, which means he's the worst person. Lah. Basically, he's the worst of all sinners. Now, this is relevant to all of us. Why? This, when we read this, when we read Apostle Paul writing that he is the chief of all sinners, this should make us reflect on our own lives. Why? Because this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about. This was the guy who, was, who I mean, he brought the gospel so far. He did so much for the Lord. He, he, he preached the gospel. He served the Lord. He suffered for the Lord. He will finally be a martyr and give his life for the gospel as well. In fact, most, uh, much of our New Testament today is written by him. I mean, this is a great man of God. And yet this great man calls himself the chief of all sinners, the worst of all sinners, or the highest ranking among all sinners. And this is something that we should reflect on. And this is something that probably we all need to come to as well. Because today, what I want to share with us is this, that all of us must come and recognize that we are the chief of sinners. You are the chief of sinners. The person beside you is the chief of sinners. I stand here, the chief of all sinners. See, Paul had that understanding. He had the understanding of just how unholy and unrighteous he was, but yet he was used in the hands of a holy and righteous God. And you know what? He was not the only person who had said this in Scripture. If we look all throughout Scripture, many people in Bible have said this as well. In Job chapter 40, verse 4, what did Job say? Job said this, Behold, I am vile. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Isaiah himself said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, or I am a sinful man, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. In Luke chapter 5, verse 8, Peter, Peter said this, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. I mean, imagine that. Peter, when he first, when he encountered Jesus, he was saying, Lord, depart from me. Get lost. Don't even stay near me. Why? Because I'm a sinful man. Don't even come near to me. And if you go back to Paul again, in other parts of Romans, in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, he said this, what a wretched man I am. And with that, I remember like about three weeks ago, I shared with us the story of John Newton who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. And how does Amazing Grace start? It says this, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. See, the point I really want to hit home today is this, that we must come back to this conviction that we are really all sinners. We must understand that we are sinners. And not just that, according to Paul, that we are the chief of sinners. That we must come to this understanding that, that any kind of sin is so bad to God, God cannot tolerate it at all, that it's like as though we're the worst of all sinners. 
And maybe some of us are thinking about this, you know, wow, pastor, you come and talk about this, you say, wow, we're the worst of sinners, we're the chief of sinners. That, that, that puts me really down, you know. I'm not here to put us down. In fact, I want to tell you this honestly, that the more we come back to this truth, the less you will actually feel put down. To be honest, the more I grapple with this, I don't actually feel put down. The more I realize how wretched I am, how much of a sinner I am, how, how, how um, undeserving I am of God's grace and mercy, the more I understand that, I actually feel more elevated. Because only when I understand how wretched I am, then I can come and appreciate the amazing grace of God. That God would care for me, that God would love me, that Jesus Christ would come onto earth to die for me, even though I'm a wretched man. You see, it's one thing to die and to sacrifice your life for a good man. It's another thing to die and sacrifice your life for a criminal, for a terrible person, for a murderer or whatever, which is the same as all of us. That's what sin is. We are the chief of sinners and God died for us. And so the more I think about it, I don't feel put down. I actually feel elevated. Because it's with that that I can understand and appreciate just how amazing God's grace is for us. And today I want to tell you this. Yes, I may say that all of us here, all of you here, everyone here, we are all the chief of sinners. But I want to tell you this, there is still hope. There is hope even though we're the chief of sinners. And this hope comes from Jesus Christ. And today the question I want to explore with all of us is this. What hope is there for a sinner like me? If you say, Pastor, I'm the chief of sinner, I'm the worst, fine if I accept that. But what hope is there for me? We're going to share with you two things. Two very important reasons why we can find hope, even though we are the chief of sinners. What are these two truths? The first truth is this. Even though you and I are the chief of sinners, we have a God of possibilities. Even though you and I are the chief of sinners, we're the worst of the worst, if you're going to call it, we're the scum of the earth in that sense, yet we have a God is a, who is a God of possibilities. When He looks at our lives, He does not just look at us based on all the problems that exist in our lives, but yet He looks at us based on the possibilities in our lives. See, the Bible says something very interesting in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation that God no longer counts people's sins against them. You see, this is something important here, that when God looks at us, He is not just holding us towards all these problems He sees in our lives. Now, what I mean by this, I want you to think about this for a moment. Maybe you can have a, you can have a, a, a mental exercise, if you would, right now. You see, if I were to ask you to think about this, Think about one family member in your house right now. Okay, one family member. Maybe husband, wife, your kids, your parents, brother, sister, whatever it is. Think about that one family member. I'm sure if I were to ask you to write down a long list of all the problems you see in this person, I'm sure you can give a quite a long list. You can write, well, oh, this person, you know, oh, I don't know, always tell a lie, always very lazy, doesn't do anything, doesn't help around, very uncooperative, blah, blah. We can write all these things down. And after a while, all, after you write down all these things, we kind of write them off, you know. That's why we make this statement. We always say this, oh, he or she, like that one. Ah. Like that one. We always say that. What happens when you say that? You basically, basically written off that person. Means that there's no chance that this person will change. There's no possibility that this person will change. But what happens is this, God looks at us and He sees all the problems in our lives. We could be lazy, we could be idolatrous, we could be, we could, we could be, um, uh, uh, we could be, we could be, addicted to telling lies. We could have all kinds of problems and sin in our lives and He recognizes that but yet He sees amazing and endless possibilities in our lives. You see, Paul had an encounter with this God of possibilities and he thanks God for not looking at him according only to his problems. What did he say in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 14? And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So he listed all those things. He's a blasphemer, he's, a, he's an insolent man, he's a persecutor. And let's take a look at Paul's history for a moment, Okay? We, let's take a look at, at, at Paul's life. I know some of us may be more familiar than others, but how was Paul like? How was Paul like in Scripture? Now, the first time we ever hear about Paul 
was at the stoning of another disciple. It was the stoning of, of Stephen, or Stephen, all right, one of the disciples. He, he was being stoned because he was being persecuted for preaching the gospel. Now, I just want to make this clarification that when you look through the book of Acts, you will hear Paul being addressed as Saul, okay? Now, those are both his names, okay? I just want to clarify this. Uh, when, when Paul had an encounter the road of Damascus, he didn't suddenly change name to Saul. No, sorry, from Saul to Paul. He always had those two names. They're just two different names. Paul is a Greek name, whereas Saul is his Hebrew name. Okay, very often we think that he encountered God and God therefore said he was renamed to Paul. No, he still goes by both names. Just that based on his ministry, it would be better, it would be more common to go by the name of Paul. So when you read scripture, it talks about Saul and Paul is the same person in the book of Acts. So the first time we read about him is in Acts chapter 7 verses 57 to 58. It says this about those people persecuting Stephen. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This disciple was being stoned and Paul was there and he was actually tending to the coats of all the people who were stoning uh, this disciple. And if you move on to the next chapter, Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says this, And Saul approved of them killing this disciple. And he goes on to talk about what kind of a person Paul was. Acts chapter 8 verse 3, But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. I like that. He says going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. I mean, when I read this, sometimes we may just glance past this, but when you read this, try and visualize this. How does this look like? I tell you, very easy to visualize it. You've, we've seen all these old clips of the Second World War. It's like hearing about the Gestapo, going to houses, raiding houses, pulling people out. That was what Paul would be doing. And finally, even when we read about him encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, it still says this, you know, Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. He went to the high priest. He asked for letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way or rather the Christians he found there. He wanted to bring them both, men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. See, this was the kind of person that Paul was. And that's why in 1 Timothy, he talks about how he was a blasphemer and so on and so forth. But in verse 13, he writes this, even though, although I was formerly all these things, but I obtained mercy. See, basically what's happening here is this. Paul was recounting all the problems that he has in his life. How he's a blasphemer, he's a persecutor, and so on and so forth. But yet, in that moment, God sees a possibility in this man. He doesn't just count him for his problem. He sees a possibility that this man can be a great man of God. He can be used by God. And I want to say this to all of us here. That's why there's hope even if we are the chief of sinners. Because regardless how messy our problems are, God always sees endless possibilities. We may think there's no hope left. We may think that's, we're at the end of ourselves. We may think that there's no way God can use us. You know what? There's, God is a God of possibilities. Instead of writing Paul off, God meets Paul. Jesus Christ gives him a new uh, 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 purpose. And if you know how the, how the account goes, Paul on the way, on the road to Damascus, encounters Jesus in a bright light and so bright that he's blinded temporarily. And God speaks to another disciple, okay? This disciple goes by the name of Ananias, all right? He spoke to Ananias and told Ananias to go and pray for Paul so that he may have his sight again. But when Ananias heard the Lord say to him, go and pray for this man called Paul, how did Ananias react? Ananias said this, you know, in Acts chapter 9, verses 13 to 14. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. What was Ananias doing right here? In his mind, he's like, God, are you sure? This guy got so many problems. Look at him. He, I've heard about all the terrible things this guy has done. In fact, you look at what Ananias said to God. He said, but, very often we say but means you, you, you're like, are you sure? Do you, are you sure? I, I don't quite agree with this. But Lord, I've heard all these terrible things about this guy. Are you sure? And God responded to him with this in verse 15. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. 
I mean, right, I just want to pause here for a moment and think about this again. This is our God of possibilities. That you look at someone's life and there's so many reasons why this person should be written off. There are so many problems, but yet God sees possibilities. And that's why Paul goes on the right in 1 Timothy 1.12. He says, He thanks Christ Jesus our Lord who has given him strength and that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Yes, in the end, we know Paul for all the great things he had done. He, had, he was a great man of God. But yet, at the end of the day, Paul was still very certain of this. He is a sinner. He's a sinner saved by grace. He knows how bad he is. He knows that to the point he'll say that he's the chief of all sinners. But yet, I'll say this. There is, there is hope in knowing that we're sinners. You know why? You know why there's hope in knowing that we're sinners? Because 1 Timothy 1.15 says this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, when we understand and recognize that we are sinners, that's when we can begin to encounter God. That's when we can encounter His amazing grace. Jesus Christ Himself said when He was walking here on earth, Luke chapter 5, verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous or those who think they're righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, knowing that we're sinners is a great thing because it's not the end because Jesus came to save sinners. And when we recognize that, then we, we enter into that, we, we say, Lord, I want to receive that saving power. I want to receive that salvation that is for all of us. See, this is why there is hope. We have hope because even though you and I are the chief of sinners, we have a God of possibilities. Today, He looks at you and He sees all the possibilities in your life. You know, one common thing that we say in Singapore is this acronym called CMI. What does CMI stand for? Cannot make it lah. Cannot make it. And why do you say someone cannot make it? It means that somehow we've written off that person already, you know. Now, I want you, I want you to think about this. I want you to look at the person on your left and look at the person on your right. Okay? I don't know what you think about that person, lah, alright? But I want to say this, all of you look at the person on the left and right. Let me just say this. Hey, the person sitting right beside you could one day be a pastor in this church, you know. Now look to the look to the look to the person on your left and right again, huh? Okay, huh? Okay? Look at the person on your left and right. You know what? That person seated there could be the next senior pastor of this church, you know. You see, you see, hey, let, let's pause it for a moment. I'm sure some, a lot of you will be thinking, huh? No la, cannot be la. Cannot not, not me la, cannot make it one, cannot make it one. Well, you know what? When we have that kind of attitude, it means that. We only see the problem because say, I cannot make it because I got this. I'm not, I'm not holy enough. I don't know enough. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not this. I'm not this. A lot. We're looking at all these problems, but God doesn't, God looks beyond the problems and He sees endless possibilities. That is who we have. We have a God who looks at us and doesn't say, cannot make it. Instead, He looks at you and says, can make it. Tell the person beside you, say, can make it. That is why I say he is a God of possibilities. Ananias, when he heard about God calling Paul, he's like, are you sure this guy probably cannot make it? But God says to Ananias, this guy can make it. He is my chosen instrument and I will use him. That is so amazing. And when we realize just how much we don't deserve, how much we don't deserve to be used by God, yet God sees endless possibilities in our life, that is so amazing. That, 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 I'm so thankful for that. For God's amazing grace. And you see, at the end of the day, right, as if we're the chief of sinners, you see, we must understand how bad we are so that we can experience and encounter God's amazing grace. And at the end of the day, God is a God of anything is possible to God. I want to bring you back to this passage, Matthew chapter 9, verses 23 to 26. Jesus said to his disciples, let me tell you this, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? And what did Jesus say? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Because He's a God of possibilities. A lot of us, maybe today, you have written off somebody and say, this person always like that one. He will never change. This person cannot make it one. But you know what? I want you to think about this for a moment. What if God had thought that way? What if God thought about us in that same way? 
then there will be no hope in our life. But today we have a God who doesn't think that way. God is a God of possibilities. A few weeks ago, I shared with us this quote written by Oscar Wilde in one of his plays. And in that play, one of the characters says this, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. What beautiful truth we can hear from a play right there. And it says every sinner has a future. You know why? Because God is a God of possibilities. So today, that's the first thing, the first truth I want you to know. How is it that we can have hope even though we're the chief of sinners? Well, because you and I may be the chief of sinners, but we have a God who is a God of possibilities. When you tell the person, say, beside you say, He is a God of possibilities. And what that means is that you and I can make it, all right? So that's the first truth. But the second truth is this. The reason why we can have hope, even though we're the chief of sinners, firstly is because we have a God of possibilities, but more than that, we also have a God of patience. We have a God of patience. Now, I've actually shared with us about this several on several occasions, but today I thought I'd like to unpack this idea and understanding of patience a little bit more. Because when we unpack it, then we understand just how good God is. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, we read it earlier. Okay, this, uh, in the NIV, it says this, For that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners or the chief of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience. His immense patience. Now, let's pause here for a moment. See, sometimes when we talk about this word patience, we have a lot of different understanding about it. In fact, most of us in English, our understanding of patience is this, oh, uh, waiting, lah, okay? I've got to be patiently waiting for a bus, waiting for something, patiently waiting for someone, whatever it is. But there's a different understanding when we look at different versions of Scripture. It was a deeper understanding. If you recall earlier on, we, when we did our Scripture reading, we actually read through, if you saw on the screen, the New King James Version. Because the New King James Version records it and uses a different word. It says this in verse 16, However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all Long suffering. This is a very interesting word here. It contains the essence of patience, but it goes beyond that as well. And long suffering is easy for us to kind of understand as well. Because long suffering, you think about it in English, literally to suffer long, to suffer a long time. Okay, in a sense, when God talks about patience, it is actually long suffering. If you go and search in a dictionary, long suffering is defined as this having or showing patience despite troubles, especially those caused by other people, patiently enduring lasting offense or hardship. This is, it has the element of patience, but it goes beyond that as well. And this is very important for us to understand this. Because when we understand long-suffering, then we understand who God is. You see, when we talk about us having sin, and the Bible says that God is being patient for us, it's not just that, God is sitting there, standing around waiting, you know, oh, I hope, I hope one day Daniel will wake up his idea. I hope one day he'll realize he's a sinner. And just, until then, I'll just patiently wait here. Like, I, got, I got nothing to do. i just sit here and wait. That's not what it means, you know. What it actually means is that long suffering, God is it's as good as like God is suffering, you know. Because God cannot tolerate that sin. When He sees us having sin in our lives, He is, he is enraged. He, has that, he is in pain because of that. It's like He's suffering. Why? Because look in Scripture, He cannot tolerate sin in any way. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. God cannot tolerate any kind of sin. And, he, and in that note, it means that He cannot tolerate the sinner as well. That's why Peter said this to Jesus, Lord, depart from me because I am a sinner. Depart from me for I am a sinner. You see, this here tells us about God's nature. He is so holy, He is so righteous, He is so pure, He cannot tolerate sin at all. He cannot tolerate it. You know, I, I try to think of an example for us to understand. I think it pales in comparison, but just imagine this for a moment. All of us here, all of you here, all of us, every one of us, Everybody has a certain pet peeve in our life, a pet peeve, certain things that you cannot stand, that you cannot tolerate, if you would. I don't know what is it. Everybody has different things. Maybe some of you, uh, well, okay, I give, use me as an example. Lah. One thing I cannot stand, one thing I cannot stand are people who chew with their mouths open. It's a pet peeve. 
It's a, I mean, that's why it's, it's called a pet peeve. It's me. I'm not saying I hate those people. I'm not saying, but it, it, I cannot quite tolerate it. Other people may be different. You may have the same thing. Some of you, I asked the youth service this afternoon. I said, any one of you got the same pet peeve? And one guy raised his hand very high, very proud about it. But some people, we got their different pet peeves. Maybe you cannot tolerate someone when they tell lies. You cannot tolerate stealing. You cannot tolerate some particular behavioral tra- traits. And when you are in that situation where, this, where a person around you keeps doing that thing you cannot tolerate, how do you feel? Huh? You don't exactly feel very shook. Right? You feel actually a bit annoyed, a bit irritated. And sometimes if it gets really bad, you actually feel like you're a bit fuming, you know? And sometimes when you come to a point where you cannot stand it, we should tell that person, hey, can you stop doing that? No, I really cannot stand it. Can you please take that somewhere else? We get upset like that. And that pales in comparison. But when it comes to sin, God has that kind of discomfort when there's sin in our lives. That He's, he's He's upset at it. It hurts him to see us living, living in that sin. And he's, he cannot tolerate that at all. That's why the Bible says that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, that God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. This darkness cannot exist. So when he's there, he, it, 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 it pains him. And it's not just that he's patient and waiting there for us to wake up our idea. No, it's as good as he's suffering, long-suffering. It, is, it, it hurts him, it pains him, it angers him when he sees us living in that sin. But you know what? There's grace there. Because if you look back at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, the prophet writes this, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. But what does he say immediately there? Yet, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you more than silent when the wicked swallow up these more righteous than themselves? What is the point he's making there? Is that God, you cannot tolerate it, but yet you choose to tolerate it. Why? Because He's a God of patience. Because He is a God who is long-suffering towards us. That He would suffer that pain, that anguish, in the hope that one day we will return to Him in repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9, right? We've been talking a lot about that. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. The New King James Version says this, the Lord is not slack, but is long-suffering towards us. See, when we understand what this patience really is all about, then we have a better understanding of God's amazing grace. God looks at us. He sees that sin within us, but yet He is patient towards each and every one of us. He can destroy us immediately. To some extent, He should, but He does not. Why? Because he's long-suffering towards us. Now let's go a little bit deeper into this to give us a bit more understanding on, on this topic. You know, one of the things that comes into the church this, this day and age is that we come to this idea that we can separate sin from the sinner. Okay? You can separate sin from the sinner. And one of the common phrases we hear is, hate the sin, love the sinner. Okay? I do agree with that. I do agree with that. And and in fact, I would say that perhaps a better way to phrase actually would be this. Hate the sin, show love to the sinner. Because you see, the more we say that, right, without the right understanding, we end up at this place of separating sin from the sinner. Church, can I tell us all this right now? You cannot separate sin from the sinner. What is sin without the sinner? What is this? Sin is an action. It is something, it's not tangible, but it does not exist without the sinner. And we always buy into this idea. We think that sin is some entity wow, that when God removes our sin, He takes out this sin and this blob of blackness comes out here and it's floating there. And then God will judge this blackness. He will punish this blackness. No. God punishes, God doesn't punish sin, you know. He punishes the sinner. Let me give you a sim- very simple example. Think of a legal court. If you go into a court, someone was arrested and convicted of stealing. At the end of the day, the, what would the judge say? Bang the gavel, he said, so and so, you are sentenced to 10 years in prison for thievery. Right? That's what happens. Have you ever seen the judge say, pam pam, okay, right now, you have been caught stealing, I sentence thievery to 10 years in prison. How does that make sense? You, you, you don't, the punishment does not go to that, that, that activity, it goes to the person. And so we have to understand this, you know, sin is very much connected with the sinner. We cannot separate this. These two things work together. And that's why Romans chapter 9, verse 22 tells us this. What if God, although choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath, prepared for destruction? 
What's it talking about? It's talking about us, you know. We are the objects of His wrath, you know. It means that with sin, right, we are the ones that will be destroyed. We are the ones that will be punished. That is the truth of it. You cannot separate sin from the sinner. The sinner is a sinner because he sins. There is sin because the sinner keeps on sinning. You follow? It's, that's how it is. You cannot separate the two things. But yet, if you go back to that same verse, you may say, wow, that's very harsh. In all the... Let me say this, church. Yes, you may, sometimes you may read the Bible and say, wow, so many things are very harsh. But the more I understand and see the harshness or the severity of God, the more amazing His grace becomes every single day. In that same thing, He says, we are the objects of His wrath. But look at that same verse, verse 22, that God, choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath. And then you go on to that next verse. And what if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy? We, we cannot deny the fact that we are the objects of His wrath. But God, He's a God of patience. He's long-suffering towards us. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants us to return to Him in repentance. And so, He does not count our sins against us. He is patient with us. He came to save us from our sin so that we won't be destroyed, so that we can finally receive His grace and mercy. We are no longer just objects of His wrath, but we become objects of His mercy. And when we finally understand this, you know, church, the more I study this, the more I realize this, then the more scripture comes alive to me, you know. Honestly, I want to say this, and I'm sure many of the pastors here and the leaders, you can, you can, you can testify to this as well. That very often, from in my own journey as a pastor, the more I serve, the more I preach every week, the more I realize God's amazing grace because I don't deserve to do this. I'm not perfect. I fall into sin. I fall into sin here and there, and yet God still causes me to, 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 he still calls me to his purpose. He still uses me. Sometimes I fall into sin in the week and that weekend I preach and I see people being saved. And I know God is not me at all. It is your grace and your mercy at work. And when I understand that, that's when scripture comes alive. That suddenly Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 becomes so beautiful. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. Again, if, you, if we ignore the fact that we were supposed to be consumed, that we deserve to be consumed, then this passage doesn't mean anything. Because if we take that out of the, comp the, the equation, that we don't, we're not supposed to be consumed, we don't deserve to be consumed, God is never going to consume us, then this verse doesn't make sense already, no? doesn't mean anything. But because of His great love, we are no longer just objects of His wrath. Instead, He causes us to become objects of His mercy. And we know God Himself is love. And how does He show that love? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole chapter on love, verse 4, gives us this very important thing. It says, love is patient. Or in the New King James Version, it says, love suffers long. See, tonight I want us to understand this. That when God sees us in our sinful state, in our unrepentant state, it's not just that He is slack, He's sitting back waiting for something to happen. No, He is suffering in that moment. It pains Him to see us living in that sin. And even though it is His right to destroy us right there and then, He chooses not to because the Lord is long-suffering towards us, not wanting anyone to perish but all to return to Him in repentance. That's the beauty of it. And today, many of us need to come back to this. You know, I've, I've met a lot of, a lot of, uh, church, I've been to a lot of churches, met a lot of pastors, and suddenly say, let's not, let's not talk about sin. Let's just talk about how we should live. Let's talk about that righteousness. I get that. But yeah, if I don't talk about sin, we don't realize how far short we fall of it, but yet God calls us and God empowers us to do His ministry still. That's when we understand God's amazing grace. And so today, these are the two truths I wanted to share with all of us. What hope is there for a sinner like me, for sinners like us? What hope is there for the chief of all sinners? Well, these two things. Number one, we may be the chief of sinners, but we have a God of possibilities. Number two, we, are, we may be the chief of sinners, but we have a God of patience. And that is something so very beautiful. 
And today, if there's one thing I want us to take back and understand, is to understand how serious sin is, its severity, and how seriously God looks at, this, at it. Only when we do that, then we can understand and appreciate grace. You know, we talk about this song, this hymn, Amazing Grace, right? Well, we have to re realize this. Often we don't know how amazing grace is because we don't realize how wretched we are. And today, that's why I wanted to bring us back to this, this understanding of this. And I pray, if I had one prayer this, this weekend, we talk about wearing white, we talk about being pure and righteous before the Lord. Well, my prayer is that we learn to see sin in the same way that God looks at sin. I came across this statement by a theologian by the name of Richard Sipes. He says this, If you can look on sin without sorrow, you have never looked on Christ. Today, this is what I pray that we'll come to. We'll come to realize just how, how severe sin is. And when we come to that realization, then we'll know how amazing God's grace is. And before I end off with a time of prayer and ministry, why don't I want to close off today's sermon with a testimony. And some of us may have heard this testimony already. It's a video of a pastor. She goes by the name of Trifina, Pastor Trifina. She was a pastor and she had struggled through many different struggles in her life, her sexuality, her own uh, sex addiction as well, and pornography and all sorts of things. And she shares this struggle and how she as a pastor struggled with it. But yet she found God's grace and God's mercy. And so I'd like you to just sit back and be blessed by this testimony as Pastor Trifina shares a story with us. I'm sorry. Sorry for using you few of you, opening doors in your sexuality, I took advantage of you, and one of you knocked on death's door. Thankfully, you, you didn't go through with the suicide, but I never truly understood your despair till years later, when I knocked on death's door myself. Looking back, I still remember the pain so clearly. She called to tell me our three-year relationship was over. She said it's because I'm not a man. She was seeing a man behind my back. Ever since childhood, I needed to be the man to protect my friends, be the surrogate husband to my mother, to be a better man than my father was. I tried to be better, but was not man enough for her. The night of our breakup felt like the longest night of my life. I look around our house filled with memories of our love. She was the first lady I found fulfillment in. Out of all the ladies I was with, we met while I was in the seminary, Bible school. Finally, a Christian like me, we shared common values. We could even study the Bible together. Well, some chapters at least. Other parts of the Bible we avoided when we were together because we knew what we were doing it was not the kind of love God intended. I held on because of the hope that we could at least do life together. Forever? Or so I thought. I left the house determined to die. I couldn't care about the many children and youth who look up to me, always wanting to talk with Pastor Trifina. Yes, I became a pastor after years in seminary. I managed to hide my lesbian ways from the world. But I couldn't hide from myself. I served a 24-hour notice and I left my job as a pastor. I was done meeting all the expectation. I left church with so much pain. Pain from causing hurt to the people that I love and I respected. 
I felt unworthy. I was that. No more mummy's good girl. No more Christian club president. No more pastor. No more people pleaser. No more protector of the weak. I started to pray on the weak. I was going to exercise true freedom. I went online and hooked up with many people. I became a sex addict. My porn habits got so out of control. I even tried sex with men just to try and feel normal. But when the sex got meaningless and tiring, I knew I needed help. After 10 years of wandering in self-indulgence, I turned back to God. I plucked up the strength to trust God again. Part of my healing process required me to humble myself, to seek forgiveness from others and forgive myself. I struggled with the person in the mirror. I was always teased as Miss Piggy in school because of my size. At the back of my mind, I held on the thought that I was at least beautiful inside. But my brokenness caught up with me. I felt ugly outside and inside. I asked God if I could ever be made beautiful. If, if I could ever be, I'm broken. I came to understand that to be unbroken, I had to piece back the dark holes in my life. I had to process my painful past and forgive the neighborhood girl who laid on top of me and kissed me on the lips when I was just six. She was also six. But I guess there was a lot going on in her own family. Her elder sister stood there and watched the act of my sexual awakening with me. Frozen, helpless. That was the first time I felt shame. I had to forgive my father for allowing the access of pornography videos in the house. I got hooked before I even knew what addiction was. I had to forgive my mom who burdened me with family problems. I felt I was robbed of a childhood to her if I wanted love. I had to earn it. I also had to forgive the first woman who baited me only to mock me because hurt people hurt people. I wanted to hurt no more. It took around 20 years to now say, I am beautiful. I didn't do it by myself. God's hand was present every step of the way. I just cannot deny His power. Today, I'm a pastor at PLU C, pursuing liberty under Christ. My team and I journey with Christians struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction. We shower them with love, acceptance, tears, and truth. We also journey with their families and church community. We show them that grace and acceptance doesn't mean compromise. You know what? Jesus sat and dined with sinners and the tax collectors during his time. He showed them the truth while showing them grace and acceptance as well. You know, they received hard truth, yet they were still following Jesus and wanted more from him. Why? Because Jesus showed love and Jesus walked his talk. And that is the kind of freedom to love that I want to exemplify today. You know, when I first heard that story, I suppose one reason why why it really struck me was because she, she, she struggled with all this as a pastor. I suppose that's why I, it really struck me that even 
you could be serving God, you could be doing all these things, but we still struggle with our inner demons. Why? Because like Paul says, we are the chief of sinners. Whatever it is, we struggle with. We got all that. And, and sometimes it reaches that point that we don't know what to do. And, and I suppose what, one part that really broke my heart was how finally she thought the only way is to throw in the towel, to quit as a pastor, to check out of life itself. And sometimes we think that, oh, by hearing all these hard things about how we're sinners and how, how, how we, we deserve the wages of sin is death and how we deserve that death and destruction. We think that's so hard and that doesn't give us any hope. But rather, when we come and realize that, that's when we give space to understand God's amazing grace. And very often why we want to step out of that pastoral role or, or, or check out of life is because we can't manage that pressure. But like what Jesus said, all this is impossible for men because only through Christ that we can gain that freedom. And today, I wanted to share this with all of us. That when we reach the end of ourselves, we just see how sinful we are. And then we begin to experience God's amazing grace at work. That's where that hope comes from. That is why Apostle Paul could do everything that he does because he understood that hope, because he, he knows how, how much a sinner he was, but yet, God saved him. God chose to use him. It's the same story of Pastor Trifina. It's the same story of many of us seated here today. And that is something that is just so very beautiful. Today, we need to, we need to talk about sin because we need to deal with that sin in our lives. But when it comes to sin, we just think, why oh, God is an angry God. God wants to destroy us. No, God says this in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And today, church, I want to say this to you. As you study through Scripture, yes, Scripture, Paul says this, you and I, we are the chief of sinners. But if you study through Scripture, there's one beautiful truth. We are the chief of sinners, but Jesus Christ is called the chief shepherd. And what does the shepherd do? In Matthew 18, 12 to 14. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill and go out to search for that one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that did not wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. And that's why with that, we talk about Isaiah 53 verse 6, that all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Him, laid on Jesus Christ, the sins of us all. Today, when we come to this truth that we're the chief of sinners, we like to talk about how we're the children of God, how we are friends of God but you know with sin in our lives the Bible says we're the enemies of God and you know what you say what again what that's so harsh again you see you see being harsh I see it as being something so beautiful because it's one like I said earlier it's one thing to die for someone you already love it's one thing to die for someone that is your friend it's another thing to die for your enemies what what did Jesus tell us to do Love your enemies. Before Jesus even spoke that, God had demonstrated that already. That He loved each and every one of us. He's long-suffering towards us. He cares for us. He calls out to us. And today, church, we need to raise this issue of sin. Because if we believe this is a season of revival, then we need to take sin seriously. We must say, Lord, come and deal with it. Lord, we confess it because we want to live holy and righteous and pure. And for all of us Christians, maybe some of us today, we know there are areas of our, our lives that we're living in sin. We're hiding that away. Today, I want us to bring it to the light. I want it to be exposed. Not so that everyone knows about it, but so that it can be dealt with by the Lord, so that we can be cleansed. And today, we need to come back to Him in repentance. And today, my prayer is this for all the Christians here. I pray that we will come to that place 
of looking upon sin in the same way that God looks upon sin. And I love this quote I found by this pastor, some of you know him, Paul Washer. He says this, The Christian can no longer stomach the sin upon which he once fed with delight, but he is repulsed by it, nauseated by his participation in it. Thus, he must confess it and be rid of it. Church, if we want revival, we must be rid of our sins. And tonight, many of us, we need to come and confess. We need to come and repent. Some of us may think, well, Pastor, two weeks ago you talked about that, we already came and repent. Three weeks ago you also talked about that, we already came and repent. You know what? Repentance is a never-ending thing. We always need to return to Him in repentance. We need to constantly come and say, Lord, forgive me. I've fallen. I, I'm, I'm struggling. And I said this to us before. Some of us, we feel so disgusted with ourselves because we keep struggling with with. We've seen, you know what I've said is, if you're struggling with it, if you have that struggle, you're in a good place. It's when you no longer struggle and you couldn't care less about it, that's when we're in trouble. Today, come back to the Lord. But I know that some of us here today, you've never given your life to Jesus before. And I cannot end off this service without giving you an opportunity to respond. And today, I want you to know that you're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. You're here because God is reaching out to you. He's calling out to you. He wants you to know that He is a God of possibilities. Today, maybe some of you seated here today, you have been a recipient of that all your life about how you always cannot make it, how you are worthless. And today, the Lord said, and today the Lord wants to reveal to you that He is a God who looks at us despite all our sin, despite all our shortcomings, He still says you can make it because He's a God of possibilities. Some of us, maybe you think that ah, God won't give me another chance. I've been written off already. I've done too many bad things. The Lord says He is a God who is patient. He is long-suffering towards us because he's, He does not want to see anyone perish, but He wants us to return to Him. And so desperate was He to save us that He came as Jesus Christ. He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And His word, the Word of God says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but so that through Him the world may be saved. Today, God is calling out to you. Maybe you think that, Pastor, I've, you talk about all this, but I'm, I'm no Paul. I've not, I've not done all these terrible things. I, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not a blasphemer. I'm not a whatever he said he was, a persecutor and so on and so forth. But all of us, we know that our lives are not perfect. We know that with sin, sin is going away from God's way. We all have done some wrong things in our life. It could be we think that it's a white lie, it's a small thing. These are sins. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. It means that when there's sin in life, I like that word there, it says wage. The wages of sin is death means, what is a wage? A wage is something you earn. When there is sin in your life, you earn death. This death is not just a physical death, it's a spiritual death, it's eternal destruction, eternal separation from God. And God suffers when He sees us in sin because He does not want us to be separated from Him. He does not want us to live hopeless life and he, it pains Him so much that He would do anything, that He says that He will make Him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. The one thing that God cannot tolerate, He put all that sin upon Jesus Christ. Like as though at that moment when He was on the cross, He was the only sinner in all the world and all of God's wrath came out on Jesus. Jesus became that sole object of God's wrath on the cross so that you and I can become the objects of His mercy. Today I pray if you don't know Jesus, you'll come and know this God. You'll come and know Him as your Lord and Saviour. Can we just all bow our heads and close our eyes for this moment right now? I want to give us an opportunity to respond. And today, like I said, there's some of you, you're here. Maybe you're not, it's not your first time you've been coming here for a few times really, but you've never given your life to Jesus before. Tonight is the night that God is reaching out to you. Tonight, God is telling you that He wants you to know Him as the God of all possibilities, the God of patience, the God of long-suffering, the God of love. 
and I pray that you'll respond. Maybe some of you are seated here, you don't know Jesus and maybe you heard this message, you don't quite know what it's all about, but somehow something is stirring in your heart and your spirit because God is reaching out to you. Tonight, I pray that you don't resist it. Come and respond to Him. I'm going to give you a moment to respond to Him and here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And if you've never given your life to Jesus before, I want to invite you to pray along with me. I will say this prayer out loud. You follow after me out loud as well. I'll say it line by line, follow after me line by line and say everything I say word for word. And I want the Christians here to pray along together as well so that no one here prays alone. And so I'm going to lead you in this prayer right now. If you've never given your life to Jesus, this prayer is specially designed for you to say you want to follow Jesus. You want to know Him as your Lord and Saviour. Then I want to invite you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Come and pray along with me right now. Let's all pray this together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. To die for my sins. So that I could be made holy. So that I could be made holy. Righteous. Righteous. Pure. Pure. And acceptable. And acceptable. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. But tonight. Tonight, I declare, I declare, you are my Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my Savior. Cleanse me of my sins. Cleanse me of my sins. Make me white as snow. Make me white as snow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to follow you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. All the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With all our heads bowed and our eyes still closed. I believe that some of us here and over there at Suntech, you prayed this prayer for the first time tonight. And if that's you, here's what I'm gonna do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count to three. And the moment you hear me say three, if you pray this prayer for the first time, I want you to lift your hand straight up wherever you are the moment I say three. I want you to lift it up so that I can see who you are, I can see where you are, because I want to speak a word of blessing over you. And maybe you didn't pray along with me out loud, but maybe you're quietly praying along in your heart or in your mind, or maybe you didn't do anything at all, but right now you know you need to respond. Then at the count of three, you lift your hand straight up as well. And some of you, maybe you've been far away from the church, You've been backsliding. And tonight you're hearing this message not by accident. God is calling you back to Him. And if tonight you want to make this prayer as a prayer of rededication, at the count of three, you lift your hand straight up as well. Wherever you are, both here and over there at Suntech, I'm going to come through right now. Don't let this moment pass you by. Come and respond. I'm going to count right now. One, two, and three. Just lift your hand straight up wherever you are. If you pray this prayer for the first time tonight, wherever you are, whether up in the balcony over here in Touch Centre, over there in Suntec City or so wherever you are, just keep and lift it up. Is there anyone else? Just keep and lift it up. I want to speak a word of blessing over you. Up there in the balcony, yes, I see your hand all the way up there at the back, over there in Suntec, so keep and lift it up. I want to speak a word of blessing over you right now. Lord, I thank you for these hands that have been lifted up because every hand represents a life and a soul. And Lord, as our friends respond to your message tonight, I pray that truly their lives will never be the same again because you are moving in their lives, you are with them and you are for them. So I bless all those of you who have responded today. The Lord says this, that you are His masterpiece, you are His workmanship created to do, to fulfill the purposes that He has given to you from a long time ago. So I commit you into His hands. I declare this over your life, that this is a new day this is a new season in the mighty name of Jesus we pray you can put your hands down amen and amen hallelujah can we just put our hands together can we thank the Lord for those who have responded can we thank the Lord for His grace and His mercy hallelujah thank you Lord and let's stand over this place and over there at Suntech I saw there were a couple of hands lifted up here's what we're going to do in a moment's time I'm going to count to three again this time when you hear me say three, I want to invite all those of you who lift up your hands. I want you to grab your belongings and make your way down to the front over here at Touch Centre, anywhere on the floor here or over there at Suntech. I want you to make your way down because we want the whole church to speak a word of blessing over you. It's alright, you're not going to come out alone. The friend or the whole group of friends who brought you, they'll be happy to come up with you because the whole church wants to pray for you. Some of you, maybe you made a similar prayer at a small group setting but you never come and make a public declaration at a church service before. Then you come forward because we want to speak a word of blessing over you and and uh, uh, some of you maybe you didn't do anything just now you didn't raise up your hand didn't pray but you know you need to respond you want to respond tell your friend they'll bring you down as well and FCBC members if you brought a guest just ask them if they'd like to respond if they would come on down with them all right so I'm gonna count to three you grab your stuff make your way down and FCBC let's welcome them ready one two and three come on just put our heads together just grab your stuff make your way down
both here and over there in Sun Tech City. I know some of you are at the back. It's all right. We'll wait for you. We want to thank God for you. We want to pray with you. Just come on down. We want to pray for you. We want to pray together with you. We want to pray for you. We want to thank God for you. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's just thank God for their lives. Over there in Sun Tech as well. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Well, all those at the front, just, just look at me for a moment. Just look at me for a moment. Over there at Sun Tech, I know you can see me as well. I just want to quickly say this, that we brought you forward because we want the whole church to speak a word of blessing over you. And we're so happy that you're here. You're part of this family. And I want to just give you this promise today. That no matter what happens in life, the word of God says this, that you can be strong, you can be courageous, you don't need to be terrified because the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So we want to bless you with this. We want you to know that God is with you. We want you to know that this family is here together with you as well. And so we want to pray for you right now. So those at the front here and over there at Suntech, do me a favour, just close your eyes and bow your heads, alright? Those here and over there at Suntech. And church, let's stretch our hands towards them and just speak a word of blessing over them right now. Lord, we thank you for all our friends who have responded to your word tonight. We declare that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, new things have come and the old is gone. So Lord, tonight we commit them into your hands. We ask that you bless them in all that they do. Bless them in their studies, their work, their relationships with their friends and family. And Lord, bless their health. And we commit them into your hands. And I speak this over each and every one of you right now. That the Lord loves you. You are His, His delight. You are His treasure. And I pray that you will receive an abundant pour outpouring of God's love so much that you will become a blessing to any person you encounter so we thank God for you we commit you into God's hands in Jesus mighty name we pray and all God's people saying Amen Amen Hallelujah but those in the front just turn around for a moment follow one of our pastors who will lead you to a room outside over there at Suntech as well and as they make their way out church come on let's just thank God for their lives let's thank God for what He's doing Quite a lot of words from the intercessors, but just for t- but these are the things that the Lord placed upon my heart as I worked on this message. Tonight, firstly, to some of us, there are things hidden in our lives that we need to confess. I want to challenge you to come down to the altar, talk to a leader, talk to a pastor. Maybe some of you can talk to your leader wherever you are, but come and confess. Don't let this, don't let sin fester in your life. Bring it to light so that it can be exposed and it can be removed. Today, I want to pray also for some of us. Your desire is this, that you want to look upon sin in the same way that God looks upon it. Well, come and pray. The only way we can do that is by walking close to the Lord. We want to come and pray together with you as well. There's some of us here, we are stuck in some kind of addiction or we we feel like we're caught in this cycle. We come to church, yes, we repent and we go back. It's back to square one. We keep falling to the same sin again. Again, we need God's grace. We need God's strength. We want to come and pray together with you and for you as well. So tonight, we need to come and we need to repent. There's some of us here, you feel that the situation you're in is totally hopeless. You feel that either it's a hopeless situation or you feel that you are worthless. Because of all this sin or all this situation, you feel that it's totally worthless. I can't do it. Well, tonight the Lord says we're going to reject that in the name of Jesus. We want you to come and respond. I want you to know that He is your hope. We're going to worship the Lord with this song, Living Hope. And we're going to sing it from the start later. Because that song starts with this, you know. How great the chasm between us. That there's such a distance between us caused by sin. Yet God chose to bridge it by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Because He does not want us to be separated from Him. And so we're going to respond to this later. But a lot of words here from our intercessors. Someone here says, 
the, the, the Lord says this, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The Lord says, this I hold against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So then a word here that says, then he said to them all, oh, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. I believe some of us here, God is challenging us in one area to deny ourselves, but we're not willing to do that. Today, come and respond. God wants us to know here that someone here, God has a purpose for your pain and a reason for your struggle. The Lord says, don't give up. We want to stand with you. We want to pray for you. Psalm 147 says, He heals the brokenhearted and builds, uh, binds up their wounds. Don't dwell in your past today. Confess and see reconciliation in your family. Only Jesus can bring about that healing. There's someone here, specifically the word here is this, you think time will heal that wound. The word here is this, time will not. Only God can bring about that healing. There's a word here for all of us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Be holy, for I am holy. The Lord our God is holy. So tonight, some of us, we need to come and respond to that word. The Lord says, Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Tonight, God is calling us to repent and come back to Him, not to receive His grace in vain. Some of us, we've been taking God's grace for granted, but tonight, we need to respond to His word. Another word here, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Some of us here, I believe you are in some kind of relationship where you're struggling with, especially with someone who's a non-believer. Tonight, come and get right with the Lord. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8 says, For He guards the cause of the just and protects the way of His faithful. No matter what you have done wrong today, God will guide you and protect you. So stay faithful to Him. And the final word here is this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Today, we need to come and respond to the Lord. The altar is open both here and over there in Suntec City. But I ask, I, I beseech you, church, if there are things that, if there's business that we need to settle with the Lord, if we need to get right with the Lord, don't wait any longer. Tonight, come and respond to His amazing grace. I want you to turn to the people around you again in groups of twos or threes. And I want us to speak a blessing upon one another. That we will live holy and righteous lives, not by our own effort, but by the grace of God that is within us. So why don't we come and pray over each other right now? And maybe some of us, you feel led to pray over a particular specific area, come and speak that new life into that situation. Come and speak and declare that we are a new creation in Christ. That today, the old has gone and the new has come. Today, speak that we will come and encounter this God of all possibilities. Let's speak that we will know that God is patient and we'll thank Him for that. So let's come and speak a word of blessing over one another right now. Both here and over there at Santec. And then we'll come together and we'll close off this time. Done, you, if you're at the front or wherever you are, if you're done, why don't we stand and lift up our hands all over this place to the Lord? Because I want to make this declaration over all of us. In the name of Jesus, I speak the blood of Jesus over your life right now. The blood that cleanses us, but more than that, the blood of Jesus that empowers us to live a life according to His purposes, to live a holy and righteous life. So I speak this upon all of us right now, that indeed we will live lives 
worthy of the calling that God has given to us. I pray that we will always be a church that has, a, has this revelation of what God's amazing grace is. So Lord, we thank you that no matter how far we've fallen, Lord, you are a God of possibilities, that you are a God of patience, that you care for us, that you call us out of that sin and into your marvellous life. And tonight, church, if there's anyone here, you think it's hopeless, you think it's worthless, I want to say this again to you. The Lord, your God, says that you can make it. He's the God of all possibilities because all things are possible through Him. And if there's anyone here, you're struggling in that sin, I ask that you will come to the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ that if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. So I speak this over each and every one of you. I declare that the victory belongs to the Lord and that victory is in you. So in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare you are victorious over that sin. We are pure and righteous because of what God has done. In the name of Jesus, we declare this. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.